Hello, everyone. Welcome to PSU for a very thought-provoking conversation on the hidden curriculum of K-12 alternatives. So this is moderated by Don Berg, who is an educator of a very different stripe. And he is an alternative education researcher, a practitioner, and author. He has written and published and pr uh, presented extensively on his ideas of alternative education. So and he has invited four of his colleagues to have a conversation with us on the hidden curriculum of K-12 alternatives. So thank you. Thank you. So I want to thank Swapna and the uh, PSU Graduate School of Education and also uh, Joyce and the PSU's math department. Um, uh, also my panelists and friends, uh, Lori Walker from the Village Home Education Resource Center. Uh, thank you. Alan Burns from the uh, Open Road Learning Community for Teens. <laughs> um, Jessica Graves and Kathy Crisp from the uh, Village Free School. Um, so I'm going to give a, a little bit of opening remarks, and then we're going to get to the question, open the panel up, uh, and we'll go from there. So there are, I'm going to talk a little bit about the context in which this discussion is happening. Um, and then we'll get to why these people in particular. So there are three major symptoms of how our system of K-12 schools is actually failing in its fundamental task of providing all children in the United, with, in the United States with an education. Uh, the first is, of course, dropping out. Uh, dropping out means the student did not have enough motivation to stay. Uh, the school was alienating instead of welcoming. And uh, in psychological terms, which is the field I study, um, the school neglected or thwarted the primary human need for relatedness, or also known as belonging. So dropping out is disengagement from the school. Um, the second symptom is failing to achieve. So failing to achieve means that the student did not have the appropriate motivation to conform. So like all organizations must, uh, schools enforce some form of conformity. Uh, but too often, mainstream K-12 schools get students to conform in a manner that is uh, controlling instead of, uh, or that is, is psychologically harmful. Um, and students who fail to achieve do not have enough opportunities for self-expression within the requirements of the school community. So in psychological terms, the school acted in a controlling manner, uh, which causes them to thwart the student's fundamental or primary human need for autonomy. Um, Failing to achieve is simply disengagement within the classroom. So the third symptom is faux achievement. So faux achievement is when school, school students fail to attain mastery in spite of their achievements in school. Uh, the students do only enough work to look good on the terms set by the system, but in a manner that diminishes the intended learning benefits of instruction. In psychological terms, the school's requirements for study neglected or thwarted the primary human need for competence. For achievement is disengagement from the subject that was supposed to be studied. So the diagnosis that all three symptoms indicate is motivational deficiencies. A large body of peer-reviewed scientific research shows that the mainstream school system fails to support students to develop appropriate motivations for learning. The engagement of students is not a luxury in education. It is the foundation. Each of the three symptoms is some form of disengagement. So the central systemic problem in mainstream K-12 schools is motivational deficiencies. Like nutritional deficiencies, these are indications that the children are not getting their primary needs met. The cause of these deficiencies is a lack of nurturing. I define nurturing as providing support for meeting primary human needs, especially the three psychological needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. This is why my forthcoming book is simply called Nurture. It is about how we can cure the, motiv the affliction of motivational defici deficiencies in schools by supporting mainstream K-12 teachers to do what they already want to do, nurture the children. 
Schools of Conscience, the organization that I'm founding, is being organized as a 501c4 political nonprofit because the substantial barriers to pre that prevent teachers from being nurturing are systemic. Without intending to, federal and state policies currently reinforce motivational deficiencies. When children are put into situations in which their primary needs are regularly thwarted, they're in harm's way and fully justified in taking action to avoid that harm. However, taking action to avoid that kind of harm in K-12 schools means dropping out, failing to achieve, and faux achievement. So creating systemic solutions that change both the behaviors and the policies that support them is what Schools of Conscience and my book are really about. It is the hidden influences that were inadvertently created by policies that are the biggest challenge to creating Im improvements in the K-12 system. The motivational deficiencies arise from the hidden curriculum. They are the result of things that are either not in the classroom or that the people in classrooms are not normally aware of, like state and federal policies. So Professor John Marshall Reeve of now at Korea University pulled out all the different reasons why teachers tend to be controlling instead of autonomy supportive that he could find in the research literature. Five of the seven reasons can be attributed to the hidden curriculum. So let me demonstrate the hidden curriculum for you. I'm going to give you two sets of instructions. In preparation, please look at my face. Now first, in any way you can, stop seeing my face. Okay? Pretty easy. All you had to do was close your eyes or look away. In preparation for the second instruction, please look at my face again. Now, as you continue to see my eyes, my cheeks, and my mouth, using only your force of mental willpower, stop seeing my nose. Okay, now, in case you're still struggling to, with that task, you should know it's actually impossible. <laughs> because of the way all human brains are wired, there are facial recognition processes that take in faces as whole experiences. The fact is that if you see my eyes, my cheeks, and my mouth, then your brain has a hidden curriculum that means you will automatically see my nose too and there's nothing you can do to change that. In education, schools make behavioral demands of children that traditional schools make uh, behavioral demands that many of them cannot comply with because of the hidden curriculum of psychological needs. School policies that reinforce alienation from school, controlling instructional practices, and trivial requirements that can be met without mastering the material are making demands that are impossible for some children to comply with. The three symptoms I mentioned are the result of hidden causes because of how brains interact with policies in systems. And we humans have had trouble with hidden causes before. In the 1850s, we thought that disease was caused by bad smells by the miasma in the air. Unfortunately, actions taken to fight disease under miasma theory made epidemics worse rather than better. But once we had studied the situation of disease with sufficient rigor, we figured out that there are these little hidden beasties called germs that cause disease. So I have to spare you details in the interest of time, but I believe that we have come to understand the situation of learning with sufficient rigor to conclude that it is not the result of the delivery of content. The unconscious assumption that the delivery of content is the central defining feature of education is at the heart of the policy movements for standards and testing, and that assumption is wrong. In, on the other hand, most cognitive scientists have come to think about learning in terms of cognitive cartography or mental map making. In education, we need to switch from the delivery theory in the, to the cartography theory in the same way that in medicine they changed from the miasma theory to the germ theory of disease. And it turns out that it was effective practice that led to better theory in medicine. In education, 
practice has led theory as well. For almost 100 years, there have been self-directed learning communities. However, scientific data to prove their effectiveness was lacking until recently. While I was writing my thesis, uh, which was published in 2013, I thought my findings were new, and I actually studied two of the programs we're going to be hearing about today. Uh, but it turns out that there have been two other groups that published similar findings in 2009 and 2011. And we all found that the self-directed learning environments we studied are nurturing places for children in the way that I've defined it. And to anticipate a common question, other studies have shown that self-directed students are normal kids and go on to lead normal lives. So the natural question is, how do they do it? I brought them together to explain their work to you themselves. I'm going to give them each, uh, each program or school up to 10 minutes to address the question that I will state. Um, then after they have offered their perspectives, we will take 10 minutes or so to respond to each other. Um, and then finally, I'll open it up to questions from the audience until our time is up at 6.30. So when we, uh, then after that, if we're still in it, we will uh, break up and you can just ask individual questions. Some of us have brought materials uh, for you to take and share. Uh, so the question is, how does your alternative school's hidden curriculum support students to become successful, self-directed learners? And we're just going to go popcorn, so whoever's inspired. <laughs> well, so um, we're from the Village Free School. I don't know if any of you have heard of us. Um, <clears throat> but we were thinking about this question and in terms of the, the ways that people can be disengaged from schools, and we thought about the ways that we are engaged with our students. And um, we kept coming back to, we have three roles at our school. Um, one role is to take care of the people of the school, yourself and each other. One is to take care of the space and our things. And one is to respect the freedom of everyone else. And we think that this provides a framework um, for how we nurture children. So taking care of space means obviously that we're like not punching holes in the wall, um, but more uh, specifically, it's how we use the space. So we use our space very intentionally, setting it up to meet the needs of the community. Um, and that has evolved over the years. Uh, we're in our ninth year now, going into our tenth next year. At one point there was a building that had many different rooms assigned to each age group. And now we're in a smaller space where we use those rooms for purpose and not for, like, five-year-olds go here, 12-year-olds go here. Um, and what we've learned about having that age mixing is that students are able to make connections with people based on who they are and not who is, like, assigned to their group. Um, and then because they're interacting with people across age groups and experiences, they're all, like, perceiving the world in different ways. So the experience of a five-year-old is very different than that of a 12-year-old, different than that of an 18-year-old. And so through those interactions, they're learning how to practice empathy, understanding where other people are coming from, um, practice patience, because sometimes it takes people a while to like stop making the noise you want them to stop. Um, and then they're learning from each other, um, modeling the behaviors that we cultivate in our school and holding each other accountable rather than adults having to step in and be like, no, you can't do that, and this is what you should be doing. They tell each other what the, the parameters of our agreements as a community are. Um, we, we set up our, our space um, democratically or collaboratively with the students, so um, any decisions made about the intention of a room is done with the kids, and so um, I think the way we purpose our rooms um, is also indicative of a, um, our hidden curriculum. We, we value play very highly. Um, we think play is what connects people to what they're passionate about. Um, small children up to us, you know, playing is extremely valuable. We value um, gathering together. So we have space 
to the entire school sit in a circle together. Um, we value classes and specific offerings and people coming together with a common purpose. And so we have space for closing the door, doing you know, hard focused work together. Um, and we value relaxing and socializing and building relationship. So there's space in our school for those things. Um, and you know, we are a free school, so kids all have choice. We're also a democratic school, so everyone has a voice. And um, our hidden curriculum, so to speak, of democracy, practicing democracy, is inherent in how we use our space. So the second rule of our school is to respect the freedom of others. And when we um, explain this to kids who are coming into the school, like the common example is if you really want to play a game with somebody, but they really want to do their own thing, like learning to let them do their own thing and not insisting that they play whatever game it is with you. Um, when we were thinking about it today, to respect the freedom of others, you first have to acknowledge that they have freedom. And in our school, we value that very highly. Everybody has freedom. They have the freedom to say, yes, I want to do that. They have the freedom to say, no, I don't want to do that. And they have the freedom to spend their time as they want to. There is there's a, a lack of arbitrary rules. There's a lack of a lot of rules. So we, we just go on the three. We come up with parameters um, surrounding things that are important to us um, that have to do with taking care of yourself and others, things like um, what kind of foods we eat, or how much time we spend on computers and other screens. Um, and all that we do is um, supporting the speaking up of, of setting personal boundaries. So respecting somebody means respecting them when they tell you, I don't want to hug right now, but thanks for the offer. Um, or please don't touch that, that's mine. Um, we have the stop seriously rule, it's like our safe word. So you're playing, you're playing, it's fun, it's fun, and then all of a sudden you're, no, 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 stop seriously. Definitely just caught across the line. And we have little pink ropes that are like force fields that you can wrap around your projects so that nobody else will touch them. And those are things inherent in our program that support um, you standing up for your freedom and um, you honoring other people's freedom and respecting other people's freedom. Um, and that goes again back to the decision making that we all come together. So we have, it's called all school meeting. Anybody can call one, everybody attends. And we get together and talk about things that are up for us. Uh, last week we got together to set up committees to um, talk about our screen use, to talk about our conflict resolution, to kind of like tweak the program going into next year based on the population that we have. Today we had an all school meeting to talk about what we wanted to do this week. It's the last week of school, we call it Adventure Week. So we're throwing all the classes out and we're doing whatever feels like super fun. Um, and so decision making is also part of that freedom. In our democratic process, um, my voice and Kathy's voice count just as much as every other student's voice in the school. So because not, so we're the adults, but we don't go in there and say, this is what we're doing this week, and that's, that's the, it. They say, that's an all right idea, but here's how we can make it better, and why can't we have more water balloon fights, please? <laughs> and then we vote for water balloon fights. Um, and the, 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 demo, the democratic decision making kind of percolates. So we do it as a, an entire school. We do it as a staff. We do it when we meet um, in age groups. We are collaborating and voting all the time. And so that's a really great way that it speaks to that autonomy, like to, to respect the freedom of others and to exercise your own requires an amount of like self-reflection and self-knowledge. Like, this is what I want. Um, and then we have taking care of yourself and others, which again, it sounds like an easy one. You know, we try not to go around slugging people but it also means eating when you're hungry and cleaning up after yourself when you're done eating so that we don't invite other unwanted visitors into our space. Um, like if you've been sitting down for a long time, maybe you need to get up and stretch. Um, asking for help when you need it and offering help when you see that it's needed. 
And so this is one of the, the beautiful things, just to go back to that age mixing that we see all the time, is that we've built this culture of kindness and this culture of helping in our school. And so if there's a small child who cannot reach the shelf where they want to get the cup so that they can have water, other students who are taller or who are not taller but who have great climbing skills <laughs> will very readily go and help them get whatever it is that they need. Um, taking care of yourself requires knowing those personal boundaries again and saying like I had a really rough night and I need to spend the first half an hour at school laying on this bean bag with like a blanket over my head or reading a book. Um, taking care of yourself is taking space when you're really upset and taking care of others is going back to that person that you're having those upset feelings with and working through whatever conflict has arisen. So if we think about that human need for belonging and relatedness, um, we spend a lot of time building relationship through conflict resolution. Kids play, kids get in conflicts, and um, as adults, um, we don't shy away from conflict. We listen for it, we help work through it, but we don't avoid it. And um, that helps to build the voice, helps to build the respect of freedom. Um, and we allow kids to encounter boredom at our school. So when you have a choice, sometimes you can't think of anything. Or when you, um, and we like kids to encounter that, so that they get back in touch with what are you interested in, what is important to you, what do you need to succeed in the life you are choosing. Um, and so we support kids in, in boredom and encountering conflict for the reasons that it um, brings you back to what you yourself need and want. And so the baseline, we have a lot of trust in kids. So. Um, I went through all different kinds of schooling and I spent some time in traditional school and I think traditional school can shy on the side of organizing your time and your energy and what you're supposed to be doing and thinking like for the entirety of your day and what that can lead to is like a disconnect in who you are and what you want to do sometimes you just want to do the opposite of whatever anybody's telling you to do um, and then sometimes when you're caught in that space where there is silence, where there is a pause, like, wait, what is it What is it that I love and that I'm passionate about? And so when we get these, like, fresh little five-year-olds, we just try and nurture that right away. Like, say whatever it is that you're thinking or feeling. We've been doing a lot of screaming it out. Like, when you're hurt or mad, just yell about it. It's totally fine. That's what you're feeling. And when we get kids who have been through some more, like, rigid school structures, we try and and re-engage them in that like, knowledge of themselves and that trust in themselves. And we, we show them that trust and that they can have that trust in themselves by trusting them. There's a lot of trust <laughs> in one sentence. There's a lot of trust in our days. Um, they know what they want and they know what they need. And so we've been told that we can be like a very hands-off school. And on the one hand, we are because we give them a lot of space to be who they are. Um, if we see conflict happening, we don't necessarily go in and stop it. We wait and see if they need us, and we trust them to tell us that they'll need us. But on the other hand, we're not very hands-off, like we're hands-on all the time. We, we have huggles, which is the combination of a hug and a snuggle. We have high fives. We show a lot of affection, and, and we're always talking, we're always communicating, and we're always playing. It's like, it's awesome. <laughs> That's the summary of our school. <laughs> awesome. And our hidden curriculum. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so I'm I'm uh, Alan Burns, and I'm here with Open Road Learning Community for Teens. Um, we are, I would say, in some ways. Um, well, I think we're all swimming in the same waters here. We're all fairly similar. Um, our basic philosophy. It uh, doesn't differ that much, I think, from, from what Jess and Kathy described, the idea of um, uh, trust being at the center of everything that we do. Um, the idea that kids who, um, the kids understand what they need 
and the kids will, f when they don't quite get where they need to go, they'll figure it out, given some time um, and some space to do it. Um, and that that's really what they need more than just about anything else. Um, so I, I'm just going to step back up for a minute here and, and give a little bit of my background, which is that I, I, I came out of, I, I was a student in traditional school my whole life um, and did well that way, and it, was, it worked for me. Um, so I thought, uh, put me on a path that I think I've, I've taken a pretty sharp detour from after a lot of years. So maybe it didn't do so well for me, but I, it felt like it did. Uh, and I loved that, and I wanted to go and, and give back and teach. And I taught in traditional high schools for uh, eight years. And um, my experience there was that 70, I would really say 70 to 80 percent of my students were not really getting what school should give them. Um, not, you know, my class, other teachers' classes, and I felt like I was really lucky to teach with an outstanding staff of, of educators um, from the administration on down, actually. And despite that, that remained true, 70 to 80 percent of the kids. Now, you had some kids who, it, just for whatever reason, like their, the, their modes of intelligence worked with the kinds of things that school asked of them. They were genuine, just, just inherently curious enough that they really did want to delve into all the subject matter in a really honest way. And so they just, they would do that. It, was, it made them feel good. It, it hit their, their receptors or whatever. And, and, uh, and they got that rush from doing that. And so it worked for them. Um, and some of those kids were high achieving kids. Some of those kids weren't necessarily high achieving in terms of their grades. Some of them decided they didn't really care that much about their grades, but they cared just about the learning. And they would get what they wanted to out of that um, to some extent. A lot of kids, and this was true of my top kids that I had in honors classes sometimes, uh, and certainly all the way down to the kids who, you know, skate through with that D minus average, get their credits and get their diploma that way, and, and also the kids who ultimately don't make it through. Um, <coughs> Those kids, uh, you know, as Don said, are, um, there's a big disconnect for them um, between what school's offering and what, um, what they're looking for. A lot of times they don't know what they're looking for. Um, and school's not helping them figure it out because school's just kind of heaping this heavy diet of here's what to do, here's what you need to do, here's what you need to do on them all the time. And the more that I saw of that, the more, it, and it took me a long, long time because I was coming from a very traditional place myself. Um, it took me a long time to recognize that, that all of that feeding, constant feeding of content and stuff, and here's where you need to be, and here's what you need to do, and the grades are due in a week, so make sure you get your stuff in. And I know you've been working on this short story and you have more you want to write, but we've got to get grades in, so get that in, you know, finish it up, wrap it up, get, wrap your work up. Don't talk, you know, be in control all the time because we have material we've got to get through. And even with older kids, um, it was this very, very rigid, rigid um, system, and they were unable to, to really learn genuinely within it, most of the kids. Um, so my movement into alternative education was just a reaction um, to the frustration of, of having to, to feel like I was pretending to do something and they were pretending to do something and we were all sort of pretending in this kind of circular game that wasn't really serving anybody. Certainly wasn't serving me as a teacher. Um, as somebody who cares about kids, and it, it certainly wasn't serving them in, in their lives and where they were trying to go. Um, so, Open Road, um, what Open Road really tries to do, it, it's, it's, uh, it's for teens, and we define our age range as, as roughly 11 to 18. Um, we'll take them a little younger if it's appropriate, we'll take them a little older if it's appropriate, but basically 11 to 18. Um, and we're trying to provide a way for kids who are truly miserable, unhappy, unproductive in school um, to realize that there are ways for them to learn that do not require them to sit in the classroom for six hours a day and then take homework home that's maybe going to take them two hours at night if they choose to do it, which often they didn't. Um, to give them a space where they could basically be themselves and where they could decide, I think I'm interested in this and I want to pursue it. Or I think I have no interest in this whatsoever and I'm just not going to do that. So the first thing that happens when we start engaging even a potential member is just a conversation. It's generally I'll sit down with the parent and, and the, 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 uh, the teen, and we'll just talk about what school's been like for them. And we'll talk about what has not been working for them and get a little bit of their personal history and what their interests are. And we talk a lot about what their interests are, what their goals are for themselves, what they see as their strengths and weaknesses. If they, when, when kids join, we have that conversation again, generally one-on-one -on -one with myself and, and each kid. Um, 
you know, what are your interests? What do you care about? What are you interested in learning more about? What do you see as your strengths? What do you see as your weaknesses? Which of those are you really interested in, in shoring up or, you know, expanding upon? Um, and do you have any goals for yourself? You know, if we look eight years down the road, you know, if you're 14, that's maybe just barely post-college. If you're 18, that's maybe, you know, late 20s. If you look eight years down the road, can you have a sense of where you'd like to be? A lot of times they do. It doesn't mean it's going to stay what they think it was at 14 especially. Um, but that's not really the point. The point is the goal setting and the idea that, okay, yeah, I'm going to think here about what I want. And we're going to start from that place instead of starting from the place of here are the subjects that I have to take and here's what I have to do to get grades in those classes and blah, 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 you know, that kind of thing. So the, 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 everything starts with them. And then we structure uh, the actual learning environment in such a way that they just come in and decide what they want to do um, on virtually every level. So, for instance, they can choose to be open road members coming in one, two, three, or four days a week. And they, then we have our, our tuition set accordingly. Um, most of our kids this year um, chose one day a week. We had one who chose two and the rest were choosing one. So it was kind of a limited, this is our first year also, I should say. Um, so it was kind of a limited program in that sense in terms of what the overall vision is. But these kids, um, that's what they wanted, that's what they needed, so that's what they did. And we didn't say, oh, well, you really should come three, you really should come four, you'll get so much more out of it if you do this or that. That's not what I see us as, as being there for. Um, we're there to enable them to come in and take what they want and get what they want. Um, once we decided it would be one day a week, you know, we opened the year with a retreat. All these kids for the first time got to know each other and had a lot of fun. Um, and then after a few weeks of them coming in sort of catch as catch can, each of them individually, maybe there'd be a couple together, maybe there wouldn't be, they decided pretty quickly that, oh, I miss it, I, I wish I want to see these other people too. So we sort of got it together that, okay, well, Thursday is going to be our day. Everybody's going to come in on Thursday. That way we're going to have community. And that was their choice. That was not something that was imposed. They wanted that. Um, I think that speaks to that need for relatedness that, that Don alluded to. But, um, but, you know, they might not have made that choice. And if they hadn't, we would have gone the other way. But they did. Uh, and I'm, I, I was glad they did. But more importantly, they were glad they did. And we were able to just do that. So they'd come in on Thursdays, and I was like, okay, well, here we are. What are we going to do? You've all got different interests. You've all got different things you want to pursue. You've all got different styles of learning. Um, and so it really became a question of how do we want to proceed? Um, and and they, so our hidden curriculum is really not so hidden, and I think that's part of the secret is that what, what is hidden in a, in a traditional setting, um, all of the sort of push towards conformity, all of the push towards obedience, um, all of the, the, the push towards um, um, really not having to be responsible for determining your own path because it's predetermined for you and all you need to do is kind of get on the track and ride the, ride the rail the way you're supposed to. As long as you can do that, you're going to make it through. Um, not, that's never discussed in school. It's just here's the material, let's get on it. We're constantly talking about what we're there for. We're constantly talking about what are we trying to get out of this experience? We're constantly talking about, um, you know, you set these goals for yourself in September, it's February now, we're sort of doing well on some and not so well on the others. What does that mean? Have your goals changed? Are you having a hard time for certain reasons? So it always comes back to the child, what the child needs, what the child's looking for, where the child's having difficulty, and how we can help them get what they want. And we sort of have these seven principles, and one of them is that it's a lot better for us to try to make possible than to try to make sure. Because you can't really make sure, you can't guarantee that, and you, you can make a kid sit in class and absorb material, but you can't make them learn it. You can't make them learn it. You can, you can cajole them into doing well on tests if they care enough about doing that. And maybe they'll learn it and maybe they won't in a way that lasts and is genuine. But you can't make it happen. But what you can do is you can listen and you can absorb what they're trying to get out of the experience in their teen years and you can help them figure out how they can get what they're looking for. And that's one of the roles, I think, as adults that we're really able to play, is that we've got all kinds of um, ideas about how they can, you know, avenues where they can go to pursue their interests that they don't necessarily know and that their parents don't necessarily know. So we work really hard to establish connections in the community. We work really hard to get kids out of the room, you know, and out into the community and hopefully um, getting jobs that are going to give them the kind of experience they want or internships or apprenticeships that are going to give them that. Um, we believe that the world is a classroom. 
um, or a, that the world is a learning environment. I really should say that the classroom is not the only learning environment that, that makes any sense or that can be. Um, and that they can learn anywhere and that they do learn everywhere. Um, whether they think about it as learning or not, they're learning all the time, as we all are. Um, and we, we talk a lot about these things. So, so part of our, part of the way we sort of interact with a hidden curriculum is to, is to take it out of the shadows and bring it to light so that it's not so hidden. Um, I think that um, everything that we do makes explicit the idea that we value each of these kids as individuals who are whose ideas for themselves are valid, whose likes and dislikes are valid, whose ideas about what they want to do in the world or what they want to receive from the world or any combination of those things, that it's all valid. That they get to be who they are, that they get to be who they're trying to be. Um, so sometimes it's just a matter of exposure and they, you know, exposing them to new things, new ideas, new, um, new things they haven't encountered before and might not on their own, and then they get to choose if they want to pursue that or not. We, we have, I have an intern that uh, is tremendous, and she is an artist and does stop motion uh, animation is one of her things, and photography obviously is a, is a subset of that. And so we did a big, long um, stretch of doing stop motion projects and photography projects because the kids just decided they got into it. She sort of introduced what she did, and we looked at some videos of some, some, some real amazing stop motion work that's out there. And they got really into that, and, and they decided they wanted to dive in, and so they did. And then after several weeks, some kids were just like done with it and ready to move on. And so they moved on to other things. And I had somebody else who interns with us who was a philosophy major in college and, and introduced all these philosophical concepts. And we'd have these kind of incredible philosophical discussions that these kids, uh, these are kids who weren't even going to school sometimes. I mean, they were just not going to their classes and failing. And they're bright, and they have all kinds of curiosities. And, those things weren't being tended in any way in regular school. And the way that we try to do things is that if they're interested, they get to pursue it. Um, and so we got into these philosophical discussions, and then it started to split where some kids were more into the philosophy. Some kids were more into just doing some artwork. Some kids were more into one kid really wanted to continue doing the stop motion, so he sort of did that. Um, one of our kids had been playing music and sort of got away from that a bit. Um, during his freshman year while he was still in traditional high school and cutting classes and getting depressed and feeling really awful about his situation. Um, all of that creativity, all of that spark has returned for him this year. It's not because we, we don't have a practice room, we don't have a, he's a drummer, we don't have a drum kit, but what we have is he's suddenly free. He's suddenly free to think about who he is, how he wants to spend his time, um, and so these things start to return on their own because he's not being sort of hampered and tied down by these other requirements that aren't really speaking to him in any way. Um, so the idea that learning happens everywhere um, and really making that, um, making that explicit from li literally the first conversations we have with them. The idea that, that their wants and their needs and their desires and their interests and their, their talents are all valid and worthy of exploration and worthy of deepening um, happens from the first conversation, continues through the entire experience. Um, I think that we also, we don't de-emphasize the idea that, there, that, that sort of more academic style learning can be valuable. Um, and some kids do like to learn by reading and having discussions and things like that, and we do a lot of that too. Um, but they get to choose it. And that's really the ultimate thing, is that they get to make the choice. And so they, the, the, the hidden curriculum for us is a lot of it comes out of that choice. And that choice is tied to freedom, and that freedom is, tried to, is tied to trust, and all of those same things that, that these guys talked about, too. Um, and, and one other thing I think that we really try to emphasize is this idea that, um, that truth and validity are not things that are sort of vested in authority. Um, they're out there. You know, the truth, what show was that? The truth is out there? Is that the X-Files? <laughs> the X-Files, right? The truth is out there. So the truth is out there. And, and for each individual, it's their own truth. And, and they, can, they can explore it in whatever way that they want to, and they don't have to get the permission or the imprimatur or whatever of, of, of authorities, whether it's teachers or school districts or the business community or whoever thinks that this is what they need to do. It's not necessarily what they need to do. 
and they get to decide what it is that they need to do, and they get to have an, they get to understand what an appropriate relationship is to authority. Now, there's a reason for authority, and, there, and there's, there's reasons to respect certain kinds of legitimate authority. Uh, and so it's not just kind of like rebel without a cause, but they get to explore, well, okay, there's authority that makes sense because that's a person I want to learn from, or that's a person who has something to offer, or that's a person who has a kind of wisdom that, that's going to feed me in some way, um, as opposed to teacher says this, got to do that, right? Teacher says this, got to do that. Principal says this, got to do that. Um, we try to make the idea of authority um, be something that they don't see as arbitrary. Um, and we also try to make it, make, help them understand that they can be their own authority. Because authority derives from something that, that is um, legitimately grounded in, in having ideas and having uh, experience and having wisdom. And those things can be acquired even at young ages and often are. And so we have explicit conversations about that. We do a lot of self-reflection with kids um, about the ways that they're wise, about the lessons that they've learned, about the experiences that they've had. Um, and I think my time's up, so I'll stop. Um, so 